Have you heard the phrase, an apple a day keeps the doctrine away? <laughs> well, probably not, because it's not actually a phrase. And no amount of apples will keep talk of doctrine away from today's program. In this episode of Doctrine Today, we'll be focusing on remotely piloted aircraft operations and, and some of the aircraft doctrines to which they adhere. We'll also examine RPAs and the doctrines they follow to support joint operations. So stay tuned as we explore these matters on this episode of Doctrine Today. Three six drive pass complete. We'll be calling in on target three one zero three in approximately three mics. Rock night three six in hot. Target thirty one zero three. Thirty one or thirty two. Flight 32 seconds. Thank you. Coming left. Pretty exciting stuff, huh? Well, it's not nearly as exciting as talking about how remotely piloted aircraft operations integrate with Air Force Doctrine. Let's start with Air Force Doctrine Annex 2-0, which elucidates the Air Force's approach to global integrated intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance operations. Today we're going to focus on a scenario RPA drivers regularly encounter, the Delisette Irregular Warfare and ISR. To help explain exactly what Annex 2-0 means by regular warfare, I interviewed an expert on the subject. Today I have the honor of interviewing Major Quint uh, something or other about uh, Air Force Doctrine. Sir, tell us what Annex 2-0 says about irregular warfare. Well, thank you for having me on your program. Targets of ISR in irregular warfare frequently differ from target sets in conventional warfare. In conventional warfare, ISR is traditionally concerned with discovering the intent, order of battle, and tactics of governments and armed forces. Additionally, in conventional warfare, ISR typically seeks to find the enemy's massed formations, which can pose a threat to friendly forces. Irregular adversaries, on the other hand, tend to operate in the opposite fashion. They rely on distribution and decentralized operations for security and protection. They are agile and often embedded within local societies. Their tactics are likely to be significantly influenced by the local society's norms and values. They commonly operate in unrecognizable organizational structures where adversary decisions are not centralized but instead made quickly and communicated laterally across the organization. They adapt to the areas they operate within and from, using available technology to closely link with dispersed operators or cells. They are usually a constellation of fighters organized on the basis of relationships and acquaintances, reputation, and fame. Their networks are typically self-forming, with new nodes constantly being created and absorbed. Evolving tactics, techniques, procedures, and financial resources enable propaganda and information to flow at increased rates, allowing powerful and nimble coordination. Irregular warfare increases the demand for global integrated ISR from lower echelon commanders. 
This is due in large part to the adversary's ability to live undetected among a population with which they are closely tied. So, sir, when we fly ISR missions, we find, fix, and track adversary activities and infrastructure, note the operating environment, and predict adversary capabilities, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Aim, of course, being to test our beliefs, confirm knowledge, and discover intelligence gaps in order to enhance our decision advantage over our adversaries. Is this how our jobs support the execution of irregular warfare doctrine? Indeed, you're quite correct. Destroy it? With a bomb? A really big bomb? Yes, sir. Once it's time to smite a target, Air Force Doctrine Annex 3-60, which deals with targeting, and specifically the weaponeering and allocation section, is of particular interest. This section goes over things that are required and should be considered when selecting weapons. Weaponeering considerations, such as the desired effects against the target, target vulnerability, delivery, accuracy, damage criteria, and weapon reliability should be considered. Appropriate ordinance can be a recommendation on the part of the targeteers, but sometimes it's the decision of the supported unit on the ground, the operations center commander, or sometimes it's just up to the crew to do what makes sense. Pretty crazy, huh? Once all this weaponeering and targeting information has been settled upon, it'll usually be briefed up in the cockpit. It might sound a little something like this. Alright, so I'll start the slap them brief if we have everything else settled yeah, here. We're oh. set, ready to go. Alright, crew, uh, be uh, dropping at GBU 12 inert station 3 on uh, this, our first target here, which have in the crosshairs. Laser code is going to be 1511. Laser? 1511 one, set and on and up right now. Roger. Autopilot airspeed are good. Payload? Set. Update is in manual. Once again, master arm is going armed. My weapon is the aforementioned uh, GBU target. So you have an aim point like that track button. Um, what hold on? Right. We'll be uh, northeast to southwest. Shift plan negative. Rest uh, on a uh, left hand turn uh, to this to come back to our northeastern sector. Here. Clearance will get uh, call in for the, with the rock. Okay. When things all go right, it can make for quite a show. However, things don't always go all right. Out here in the desert of Iran, the wreckage of this T-130 provides a grim reminder of the terrible price that can be paid when joint operations go awry. Fortunately, for those who have difficulty falling asleep at night, we now have joint doctrine publications available to us. These contain fundamental principles that guide employment of U.S. military forces in coordinated action toward a common objective. How do our operations support the joint fight? Well, let's look at an example from Joint Publication 2-0, covering Joint Intelligence. Tactical intelligence is used by commanders, planners, and operators for planning and conducting battles, engagements, and special missions. If a team of Army Rangers is going to raid a compound, for example, using intelligence gleaned from RPAs allows tactical units to achieve positional and informational advantage over their adversaries. RPAs can also provide support during the raid. Calling out precise threat locations, tracking, and targeting are essential for success during actual mission execution. By doing this, the RPA crew, while adhering to Air Force doctrine, is simultaneously cooperating with joint partners to achieve a common objective. This unity of effort is one of the key principles of joint intelligence. My, that was a lot of information on which to chew. Well, thanks for tuning in to this production of Joint Doctrine, and be sure to join us at this time next week. Next week on Joint Doctrine, morale at SOS, how much is too much? Joint Doctrine Investigate.